The U.S. men's national team is reportedly hiring outgoing Chelsea coach Mauricio Pochettino. Another NBA team has ditched its regional sports network, and ESPN is letting go of some high-profile on-air talent. It's Friday, August 16th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today we're speaking with Will Balsam of the Yanks Abroad podcast on the implications of the U.S. Soccer Federation hiring Mauricio Pochettino to lead the men's national team with the massively anticipated World Cup in the U.S. coming in two years. My colleague Eric Fisher joins the show to discuss the crumbling state of RSNs in light of the Portland Trailblazers cutting ties with its cable broadcaster. We also have our multimedia reporter Daryl Barnes making his podcast debut to discuss what's been popping in sports social media. First, let's hit some headlines. The U.S. men's national team is about to have a new head coach. Thursday morning, ESPN reported that Mauricio Pochettino, formerly of Chelsea FC, has agreed to become the team's new lead man. Pochettino mutually parted with Chelsea earlier this summer after just one season with the team. No official deal is in place, and the USSF board of directors has not given the green light yet. Nonetheless, all indications are that this will soon be finalized. The Portland Trailblazers are staying true to their name, parting ways with regional sports network coverage as they turn their focus towards over-the-top streaming alternatives. The Blazers had been with Root Sports RSN for two seasons and announced on Wednesday that the decision for the future television home of Blazers basketball will be made soon. The Suns, Jazz, and Pelicans will also be without an RSN affiliate for the upcoming season, and 14 other teams' futures are up in the air after Diamond Sports declared bankruptcy. Peacock will be running back Gold Zone in 2028 after a massive success in the Paris games. NBC's president of production, Molly Solomon, suggested that the format could look slightly different, but said, how could you not have a returning gold zone in Los Angeles, and it may even be more hours a day? It is also possible the Whip Around show makes its Winter Games debut in 2026. Indianapolis will be the site for the 2025 WNBA All-Star Game. Coming off the heels of a successful All-Star Weekend for the NBA this season, Indy will host the Sister League's version of the festivities on the same floor that has seen Caitlin Clark break countless records for attendance, ticket sales, and more this season. WNBA Commissioner Kathy Engelbert pointed to Indianapolis' incredible and enduring passion for the game of basketball, for what makes the city such a perfect fit. John Dexter appears to be swapping one Premier League team for another. The majority owner of Crystal Palace will have to sell his 45% share of the team in order to complete his takeover for Everton. Dexter has entered an exclusivity period with Everton's majority stakeholder, Farhad Moshiri. Dexter told The Athletic in May that he had already had conversations about buying Everton. The U.S. men's national team fired head coach Greg Berhalter after a disastrous Copa America in which they did not make it out of the group stage. Now it is being widely reported that he will be replaced by Mauricio Pochettino, who left Chelsea earlier this summer. I spoke with Will Balsam, co-host of the Yanks Abroad podcast, on what this means for the U.S. team and program, and that conversation is coming up next. I'm joined now by Will Balsam, co-host of the Yanks Abroad podcast. Welcome, Will. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Exciting news today. Yeah, so let's get into it. Mauricio Pochettino is reportedly joining the U.S. men's national team as the head coach replacing Greg Berhalter. Not official yet, but ESPN seems pretty confident this is happening. What's your just top line reaction to this news? Top line reaction is the U.S. have gone out and got a premier coach who has coached at three of the biggest clubs in the world. Obviously, Chelsea most recently, some time at Paris Saint-Germain with you know, some of the biggest stars on the stage, as well as, you know, probably his most impressive stint was with Tottenham, taking them to a Champions League final heights that the club hadn't reached really in about 30, 40 years. Um, He didn't win necessarily a trophy there, but the things he did there obviously are what really brought him to the main stage. And this is a huge, huge signing for the U.S. men's national team, who at a point since Alter's firing looked like they were going to go down a similarly bad path as they had previously. So for U.S. soccer fans, this is a very exciting day. I want to kind of get into, you know, the implications for what this means and the expectations it puts on the U.S. program. Before that, so um, Pochettino left Chelsea this summer. They you know, mutually parted ways. Should we see this as, you know, what like a, a big win for the U.S. team is, you know, not good enough for Chelsea? Or is it more like, a, you know, that was one situation and this is a totally separate situation. We shouldn't be you know, putting them on the same scale. Listen, for U.S. fans of sport, uh, managing Chelsea right now would be like managing the Washington Commanders the, under Dan Snyder. Let me be more clear. It's a bit of a dumpster fire. So Pochettino comes in, has the first six months of utter nonsense, but then finishes the season incredibly strong, putting Chelsea as one of the best teams in the league in the last three months. And then all of a sudden, they've let him walk. That has nothing to do with him. That has to do with Todd Bowley and the people in charge of Chelsea. 
This is a massive, massive signing for the U.S. men's national team. This is not picking up scraps. This is going out and getting a premier manager. That's the only way to look at it. So, and yeah, let's get into expectations around the U.S. team. Uh, Copa was a huge disappointment. The World Cup before that was, you know, I'd say they kind of hit par. You know, they they got into the elimination round and didn't, you know, go anywhere from there. But, um, you know, what kind of expectations should we be coming into the 2026 World Cup uh, with Pochettino at the helm? I think we need to tamper expectations a little bit for some fans who are saying we're now World Cup favorites. That's not quite the situation. But what what's more important is... Under Greg Berhalter, yes, we made a World Cup knockout round, but the football we were watching was was not fun. This was not a manager whose tactics were good. He was going out there playing not his best 11 every week. He was bringing MLS players into the side that had no right being in the side when you have players playing in Europe. What Pochettino is going to bring, not only is it going to be a little bit more consistent, but we're going to play some pretty beautiful football, which is going to be very exciting and really help grow the sport here in the United States during a World Cup cycle that you know, is going to probably change the outlook of soccer over the next 20 years in this country. You're going to have young kids who, you know, prior may have decided to play American football or basketball or baseball. But after watching some of the football that we think Maurizio Pochettino is going to bring to the U.S. men's national team, they're going to want to play soccer. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch this team, whereas in the past, you didn't even know if you were rooting for the team to win because it was so boring. So that, to me, is what's most exciting about Pochettino. He's an attacking manager. He is going to put his best 11 out there and try and go score goals. And for Americans who aren't too familiar with the sport or who don't like a nil-nil draw, this is a manager for you. Let's talk about the the head coach role a little bit. I mean, you know, obviously they, they dictate the style. They dictate who's on the field. Um, but they also seem to have kind of like a almost a GM type role of, you know, deciding, you know, who where they're going to pull from, who they're going to recruit, all that. So. Yeah, is this kind of goes beyond what you're what in an American sport you might think of as like the head coach? Yes, most definitely, especially in the national team setup. It's a little different in a national team versus a club. But for Pochettino, the next month before the next set of friendlies is going to be going through the list of players that the U.S. Soccer Federation sends his way, doing so much video scouting that will take up hours and hours a day and figuring out you know who the best players are to bring to training camps. Then from there, figuring out who the best players are to name in each match day squad. So that'll be a few friendlies in September. Then we're going to have a little break again until the next set of friendlies, and he's going to have to revisit all that. He's going to probably end up traveling to somewhere between five and eight countries in the next month, watching these players play in person, seeing how they play in a real environment, in, in an away environment, in a home environment, how they play against a, an attacking team, against a defensive team. There's so many different things that go into it as a national coach because you're not really getting to scout these players playing together all that often. So... It's a very complicated role, and you'd have to hope he's familiar with some of these players in Europe, which is a, which is a big leg up. Because if we had a bunch of players playing in the MLS, he wouldn't be familiar with them. And so you you would think he's watched Christian Pulisic, who was at Chelsea uh, before Pochettino was there. You think he's watched Fuller and Balogun, who was at Arsenal, and then uh, doing well in France, and the players like that. So I think he'll be well versed in the players, and it'll be interesting to see how he handles getting that right twenty five players for a squad together, and then putting the best eleven on the pitch. A part of the role I find very interesting because, yeah, you don't just have like a regular season where the U.S. men's national team is just like, you know, playing 20 sure. games, 30 games against against other countries. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about Emma Hayes coming into the women's team and having very little time before the Olympics and coming away with a gold there. Um, obviously, Pochettino has more of a runway heading into the World Cup when, you know, which is the next time most Americans are going to be tuning into this team. The, is what is he able to actually do with that? I um, mean, you were just getting into it in your last answer, but um, does he have, I mean, it's an, an extra year, but how much can he actually use that year? Yeah. I mean, it's a bit complicated actually, because since we are hosting the world cup, we don't have to play world cup qualifiers, right? So every other country, except for the United States, Mexico, and Canada will spend the next two years playing world cup qualifiers to try and qualify. But as a host nation, you're automatically in. Therefore, we're really going to be playing friendlies for the next two years, which I wasn't all that excited about, but I also do think it gives Pochettino the ability to really experiment and find his best 11, which is a bit lucky for us in a lot of ways. I think if he was forced to play qualifiers, he'd be forced to put those same 11 players out that we've seen you know, pretty much year in and year out for the last couple of years under Bear Alter. Whereas in these friendlies, as long as the fans are willing to be patient, and I think they will, 
he doesn't have to worry too much about the results. It's about seeing good passages of play, seeing good 20 minutes at a time. Then in three months, we'd like to see a good four, you know, half at a time. And hopefully in a year's time, we're seeing consistent 90s that are well doing where he's playing well. And then we've got a whole year basically to run up and find that best 11. So I think prior when we, you know, we were playing under Bear Alter, and if he was going to stay as the manager, I was really worried about this next two years of friendlies because there'd be no pressure. There'd be no reason to switch anything around. Whereas this actually is going to give a brand new manager time to figure it out without that pressure of getting results. And then hopefully in 2026, he's had enough time to get that best 11 together. And the one thing about Pochettino that's good to remember is he's known for developing young players and getting the best out of them. And this is a young side. So it really works out well. Let's briefly hop over to another Premier League topic. John Texter, currently the owner of Crystal Palace, is reportedly looking to dump his shares of Crystal Palace and become the controlling owner of Everton. Um, is this something that happens where an owner in the same league says, actually, I want that team and you know sells one and grabs the other? Yeah, we, we've seen it prior. We've seen uh, Man City and Man United kind of get around this job, uh, joint club ownership thing. We've seen it with Jim Ratcliffe, who was somewhat a partial owner of Chelsea. Now he's a partial owner of Manchester United. And it's basically like investing in stocks in a way. So as long as Texter can get down to 10% ownership in Crystal Palace and he doesn't have any say in the footballing interests of the club, it's basically a blind trust. You can just think of it as if he has a stock on the New York Stock Exchange. He's just basically putting money into a club and hoping that he's going to get a return. He may, he may not. And that's a similar situation in, in how he can become a majority owner um, in Everton and actually have a say in it. So it, it seems a little bit more convoluted and more of a conflict of interest than it actually is. And that's how I first read it. Uh, but after doing a little bit more research and, and realizing that this has been done prior and we're actually seeing this more often than you would think, I think this is a good fit for John Texter. You know, Everton just, you know, almost got relegated because they it took a major uh, financial fair play penalty last year. Um, is this a more desirable destination than Crystal Palace? Well, it is and it isn't. Um, Everton have kind of had a lot of things going on in the last few years. Obviously, they're not even the best club in their, you know, area. Liverpool across the way, their biggest rivals have really been dominant in the last 20 years. Having said that, Everton are putting together um, in the midst of building a unbelievable new stadium that's going to host many non-footballing events, which is a huge way for the club to bring in profit. And it seems to be the way that a lot of these clubs are moving. I mean, look at Tottenham. Since they've built their stadium, they've hosted NFL games, massive concerts, um, endless. I think it was like four or five nights of Beyonce in a row, like things that are bringing so much extra profit into the club that the actual What's going on on the pitch doesn't matter that much as long as they can stay in the Premier League. And so I think that's where Texter really is seeing uh, the investment being worthwhile. Whereas at Crystal Palace, Selhurst Park's amazing, but it is not going to be hosting any Beyonce concerts anytime soon. Let me tell you that. So I think where from a Texter and from a business point of view, what they're seeing is a new stadium in a major city. And that is a good investment. All right. Will Balsam, really enjoyed the chat. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. It was fun. Thank you. ESPN has fired Robert Griffin III and Sam Ponder for budget reasons, first reported by Andrew Marshand of The Athletic. At the time of this recording, those two are the only on-camera personalities to get the axe. Griffin had already been demoted by the network, getting pulled from Monday Night Football in favor of Jason Kelsey. He had two years left on his contract. Ponder had been with ESPN since 2006 and has long hosted NFL Sunday Countdown. The Athletic names Laura Rutledge and Mike Greenberg as potential replacements for that role. Both are making upwards of seven figures annually, but Marshan reports that the deals will be honored upon their exits. You may have heard the name Monty Harrison before. He was drafted by the Milwaukee Brewers straight out of high school, spent a few years in the minors, and then finally made his big league debut in 2020 with Miami Marlins. Harrison proceeded to make some sporadic appearances over the next couple of seasons for both the Marlins and Angels, but his career in baseball seemed to sputter out after being let go by the Milwaukee Brewers last year. However, Harrison has found a second chance in a different sport, Coming out of high school, he was clearly a highly rated baseball player, but Harrison was also a four-star recruit in football. And now, at 29 years old, Harrison is making his college football debut as a freshman at the University of Arkansas. He's not the first former professional athlete to find a second chance in college athletics with J.R. Smith playing golf at NCANT. It's never too late to try something new. The Portland Trailblazers are leaving their regional sports network, Root Sports. My colleague Eric Fisher joins us next to discuss what's next for this team and what to make of the growing trend of NBA and NHL teams cutting the cord. I'm joined now by Front Office Sports newsletter writer Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Great to have you on. So the Portland Trailblazers are the latest team to drop their regional sports network, Root Sports, 
as of this recording, they have not announced what they're going to do exactly, but what direction do you see them going in? The direction is going to be very similar to what the Suns, the Jazz, the Pelicans, several hockey teams have done, and it's going to be a combination of local over-the-air television and streaming and definitively moving away from that traditional RSN model. You know, this is obviously, it's becoming more and more of a trend. This will be somewhat of review for some of our listeners, but why is why is this movement happening at all? So essentially the the cable system and certainly the RSN model within the cable system is uh, dying sort of as we know it here, that you've got more cord cutting, more cord nevering, you've got fewer cable households uh, in existence. And the ones that are cable in many instances, uh, the RSNs, Root Sports included, are being put on higher tiers. So that just means fewer households that these networks are in, which means less revenue and you sort of get that downward spiral based on where we were before. And so uh, what these teams have been doing is searching for uh, safer ground economically. And even if there's a short term revenue hit, the bet is that because the cable industry continues to be in this state of existential decline, that moving to another situation with over the air television and streaming is going to be better in the long run. Right? Yeah, they might get a smaller audience. But um, but yeah, it's, they get to start to build their own audience and they get to keep most of that money as opposed to, you know, constantly fighting with these cable companies over how much their, their RSN is worth. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that, that traditional model is just in this sort of existential upheaval. And so uh, teams like the trailblazers are sort of at the tip of the spear in terms of this transition, but there's certainly going to be more to come. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, on the teams that have made this jump already. So New Orleans Pelicans, Utah Jazz, Phoenix Suns, now the trailblazers, the Suns, you could say, are a major market team, but there seems to be kind of this sweet spot of like a mid-market team, you know, that maybe is willing to take a small revenue hit, but you're not New York and L.A. and you don't already have kind of like, the, you know, this maybe your own network that you're already feeding off of. Does that strike you as kind of the the current, you know, the the teams that make the most sense to make this move right now? Yeah, I think that's a pretty accurate profile that you're you, we're not dealing with your, you know, Lakers, uh, Yankees type of franchise that, you know, somebody a little lower on the food chain in many instances close to the end of the uh, expiration of their existing contract. So it wouldn't have made sense to go into another deal anyway. In the case of Trailblazers, they only had a year left on the existing deal. So there was an amicable split on, you know, and, and uh, foregoing of that final year. But that profile is really on point that you're you're talking about sort of mid-tier franchises in essentially at most every instance not a recent champion either the nba obviously just signed its massive you know, 76 billion dollar 11 year national media deals do they seem content to kind of let each team go its own way and figure out what makes the most sense for them are they intervening here at all well, yes and no. I mean, every deal has to be approved. Um, you don't want to sort of have something crazy that runs afoul of labor or something like that. So all these agreements have to sort of go through your normal checks and balances. Uh, but what's interesting is that, um, and as I wrote today, uh, you've got this situation which may have some sort of corollary or sort of follow-on effect of what's going on with Diamond Sports Group. This is a separate RSN group, but you now have four teams in the NBA that have done this. You've got 14 others in the in the Diamond Sports Group umbrella, and some of those may jump ship and say, hey, you know what? I don't want to stick with Diamond. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with that bankruptcy situation. This other situation looks a little bit more attractive you know there's getting to be a critical mass of teams on the other side here maybe we do that too and so that's all happening and while the nba is in the midst of negotiations with diamond on a revised deal and so how many teams are left in that revised deal that's one of the things we're going to be watching you know the N nhl you know it's got it plays at the same time as the nba it's got about the same number of games as the nba um, you mentioned a couple teams like the Kraken and the Panthers are have already made that move. Do you see the NHL is kind of following the same path, maybe just a year or two behind the NBA? Yeah, very similar. Um, it's just a little bit different in the sense that the NHL is a more in-person gate-driven league in terms of their overall economic model. Um, 
not drastically different, but just, you know, more, a little bit more in that sort of gate driven uh, uh, revenue model. So it's going to be a lot of the same trend lines and just evolving, maybe at a slightly different cadence, but fundamentally the same thing that we're talking about. How about MLB? I mean, they're sort of the most entwined with Diamond and the most, you know, the probably the, the greatest consequences in terms of like how their bankruptcy plays out when it Number comes to the major games, leagues. Sure. Yeah. Do you see, can, can MLB teams start making this move as well? Or are they, are they all just kind of like wrapped up with Diamond until something breaks one way or the other there? Yeah, so they're they're sort of they're much more entwined, just number of teams, number of games involved. But there's a whole other holistic strategy that Rob Manfred and his team are trying to put together in terms of getting a critical mass of teams together to essentially do their own sort of streaming version, uh, a local version of MLB TV, um, and doing an entirely different league centric league driven model and that's remains a work in progress there are three teams now uh between the padres the diamondbacks and the rockies whose games are already being stood up by the league you get you know maybe another eight to ten teams at minimum something closer to half of the number of clubs overall that gets to be kind of the sweet spot that they're looking at uh in the league in terms of being able to put together a, a holistic package and being able to sell that and again depending on what happens with the diamond situation that critical mass may come pretty quickly um but um to answer your question at the at the start, baseball is trying to sort of take a, a sort of more omnibus direction in terms of kind of pooling those teams together outside of the RSN situation. Just to wrap up here, does that does that make more sense for MLB than it would for the NBA or the NHL, or is, is you know is it is that kind of like the more obvious path for them, and in, in some way that it's not for those other two leagues? Well, probably just again in the sense that there are so many games and every league has a little bit of a different split in terms of the local national uh, revenue picture. And baseball, again, because there's so many games and there's only so many that go to national platforms, that local media piece is so critically important in baseball. And that does require probably a different sort of thought process or at least a slightly different thought process than what you see in basketball or hockey. Eric Fisher, always appreciate the insights. Thanks for joining us on the show. Always a pleasure. New Los Angeles Chargers coach Jim Harbaugh wants to reunite with the quarterback who took him to the Super Bowl the last time he coached in the NFL. Harbaugh wants Colin Kaepernick on his coaching staff. He told USA Today Sports he'd be a tremendous coach if that's the path he chose. However, Kaepernick, now 36, still thinks he has what it takes to be an NFL quarterback. He recently told Sky Sports, We're still training, still pushing. We just need one of these team owners to open up. Kaepernick last saw NFL action in 2016 when he became a national symbol for kneeling during the national anthem to draw attention to social justice issues. He and 49ers teammate Eric Reid, who kneeled with him, later sued the NFL and its 32 owners for keeping them out of the league following that season. They reached a settlement in 2019. This summer, the XQB has kept busy promoting a storytelling platform, Lumi, which is backed by Alexis Ohanian's fund 776. If you want to go see a terrible baseball team 81 times next season, you are in luck because the Chicago White Sox are cutting their season ticket prices by 10%. The team will celebrate its 125th anniversary next year, coming off a season in which they will finish with one of the worst records not just in their own history, but all of MLB history. The team's current winning percentage of 238 would be the second worst in the last 124 years, with only the 1916 Philadelphia Athletics putting in a worse showing, and only barely. Should the Sox lose their next two games, you'll have to go back to the 19th century to find the remaining teams with worse records, such as the Cleveland Spiders and Pittsburgh Alleghenies. You wouldn't know it if you just tuned in, but this team was really good just three years ago. In 2021, they won the AL Central by 13 games and looked ready to bully that division for years. Instead, they've seen one of the worst slides in MLB history, right as they are trying to convince Chicago and Illinois to give them $1.2 billion for a new stadium. Front Office Sports Multimedia reporter Daryl Barnes is fully tapped into these social media conversations throughout the sports world, and he joins us next to discuss what's creating a buzz right now. I'm joined now by Front Office Sports Multimedia reporter Daryl Barnes making his pod debut. Welcome, Daryl. How's it going, Owen? Good to be here. Uh, you, you've been tracking all the, the social media trends in the sports world. Um, 
bunch of topics popping recently. What's the the first one top of your list? Okay, well, the first one is that yeah, on Thursday, the NBA sent out their or released their schedule. Um, so got the full sweep of the schedule, the full season's worth. They actually aired it on ESPN too. Um, it was a broadcast, but then they started posting out these different kind of thing week important weeks to watch. You got opening week, right? Starting on uh, Tuesday, October 22nd. You got the Lakers and the Timberwolves um, and then the Celtics and the Knicks kicking things off. Those games airing on TNT, obviously the last season it's looking like for inside the NBA. Um, but then also what interests me was they pointed out Jan- the week of January 21st is what they're dubbing NBA Rivals Week. OK, there's talking classic and, you know, budding rivalries taking the center stage. It sounds like, you know, they're just trying to make the second third of the season fun now. You know, we've got the in-season tournament to, like, get you excited early, and then they'll have this, and then, you know, then we're into the playoffs. All right, so I think we're sticking with the NBA for our next topic. Uh, we got a new venue opening. Yeah, so the Intuit Dome. The Clippers have officially opened their $2 billion arena this week, and it's actually starting off with a Bruno Mars concert. Um, And so the reason I want to point that out is because it'll be really interesting to see some of just the what this facility has to offer in action. I'll be looking on Twitter and on social, you know, for clips of this nearly this 360 degree, nearly an anchor big anchor large um, like scoreboard. I'm sure they're going to be using that in the concerts and everything. But it's just this this venue. Absolutely massive. It'll have their first their first games on October 23rd. So that'll be the actual, you know, regular season debut. But for now, it's going to be starting off with these concerts. Have you I know that you've talked about the Into a Dome a little bit like yeah. on the podcast. What are some of the things like you're most excited to see? Because it just seems like a cool place. Yeah, I mean, I'm just curious if it like truly feels different. I mean, like Steve Ballmer is a man of no small plans and he's got all the money in the world and like, I, I'm just curious, like, if you're watching on TV or, like, you hear about, like, someone going to a concert, the way people talk about the Las Vegas sphere now, where it's, like, this isn't just, like, yeah, you're in an arena, it's it's fun, but, like, similar to other stuff, or if it does, if it has achieved some kind of new level. Also, the wall, the, like, however many rows of, of Clippers fans, like, if that becomes something that other arenas look to replicate. The wall five to 25 K per season for tickets to sit there. Can't wear opponents gear. You can't cheer for the opposing team. And then tickets only resold within the Clippers marketplace. If you actually go on the website to try and sign up to get tickets (laughs) in the wall, it's like you have to qualify on like two or three of these four or five different ways. And one of the ways is like the trivia question of like, when was their mascot born? And it's just like, (laughs) and so it's definitely an interesting thing, but it'll be cool to see, you know, videos of this venue now that it's actually open and everything. And then even more exciting, October 23rd, when that first game comes around. I'm just also waiting for someone to get like kicked out of the wall because like they (laughs) cheered because like LeBron dunked or something. Um, All right. Last topic. What do you got for us? Yeah, this last one is a little more serious, um, but still surprisingly has a fun twist to it. Um, So earlier today, it was um, reported by The Athletic first, but confirmed by Front Office Sports that RG3, Robert Griffin III, was fired by ESPN on Thursday, um, basically cited as a budget cut. And, you know, this makes clear way, you know, for Jason Kelsey on Monday Night Football. But RG3 is a really active guy on social media, especially on X. And I don't know if <laughs> I don't know if you saw this. He kind of he's been posting, you know, all day long on Thursday since that since it was announced that he was released. You know, he posted news about JJ McCarthy out for the season. And you'll notice, you know, it has a little RG3 bug in the corner, right? It's not ESPN. It's him going out and doing this. But then also he posted a response to the firing and it was a clip from the movie Friday. How the hell are you going to get fired on your day off? I don't know. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, yeah, he, he's as active as ever. We had him on the show of something like a year ago and, you know, he's he's like always got a million projects going. So I, I trust he'll he'll land on his feet. Yeah, it'll be something to keep an eye on. Just keep an eye on his on his, you know, X feed and what he posts on social media, because it looks like he is still going to be active, you know, whether it's, you know, posting news, trying to break news whenever he can. So. All right. Daryl Burns, 
podcast debut. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Owen. Sprinter Noah Lyles made a name for himself at the Paris Olympics. He also made a few enemies. Here's Josh Hart of the New York Knicks talking to Jalen Brunson on their roommates podcast about Lyles. I really want him to lose. <laughs> Damn, I want him to lose, boy. I think this was the first time all of the NBA Twitter like banded together and was just hating. <laughs> it was... <laughs> I was hating, and I was just like, damn. You know what? Respect. I can't even hate anymore. The Indiana Fever released their financial report, and unsurprisingly, Caitlin Clark's effect is palpable. The Fever, who finished dead last in the WNBA standings last season, now have the best attendance in the league. The Fever have seen a 265% increase this year in fans at home games, clocking 186,000 total attendees on the season. On the social media side, they are comfortably ahead of all of their teams in terms of their engagement, video views, followers gained, and total followers. The Fever have 14 games left this season, and all of them are going to be on national TV. Merch sales have also increased by nearly 1,200%, and it's safe to say many of those have been Caitlin Clark jerseys. The Star Guard will make just 76 k in salary this year, but her financial impact on the Fever and the league feels priceless. The NIT could be coming to college football. Yahoo's Ross Dellinger reported on Thursday that group of five commissioners will meet next week to discuss the introduction of a secondary championship for those who do not qualify for the college football playoffs new 12-team format. G5 teams have a path to automatic qualification for the CFP under the new format. That would not change with the new proposal, but rather the idea is to create more interest and revenue around additional teams in college football, according to MAC Commissioner John Steinbrecher. Mountain West Commissioner Gloria Navarez called it an NIT of football. It'll be a wait-and-see situation as the ever-evolving landscape of college sports begins to reshape itself. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, leave us a rating or review or say hi on social media. We're on all the major platforms. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend. We will see you on Monday.